Hey, welcome to Taylor's Trick Taking Table. I'm Time Traveling Taylor, and it's the end of December. We're moving on to a new month that we're gonna call Japaria. It's trick taking mixed with area control. And as you can see behind me, I know my way around an area. I've controlled a few in my day. And what's that? Oh, we're two months ahead. It's November right now. Whew. Okay, could you set us back to November on the machine? Yeah, okay, thanks. Hey, no worries. We were just a little bit ahead. Uh, this is This happens from time to time. So my assistant is going to take us back to November and I'll see you in a bit. Okay, November, we're back in November. November of what year? Are you serious? And where are we, Ireland? It doesn't look like Ireland. Oh, that's what ancient Ireland looked look like? Okay, can you please just get us back to 2021? Thank you. Yeah, no one talks about how itchy time traveling is. Oh my gosh, it's the worst. Anyway, while we're here and waiting for my lovely assistant to get us back to the present, why don't we cover Brian Boru, huh? I mean, look, pretty close. I mean, I just need that stoic expression. I mean, geez, cheer up, Brian. You're the hawk noggin of Ireland. But the hook to Brian Boru, it's a game designed by Pierre Sylvester, is its area control, eh, Chaparia, mixed with trick taking. So players will be running around Ireland, <laughs> running around, trying to control areas in Ireland and uh, marriage and Vikings. There's a lot to this game. In fact, I won't cover everything. The boy King Rodney Smith did an amazing how to play video on this. So if you wanted more details or probably a nice cleaner version of a teach, definitely check that out. We'll be doing kind of a quick overview of the gameplay. But let's go to the giant table because this is a big game and I'll show you how to play. The deck in Brian Boru is three suits and then also a wild suit that counts as any of those three suits. And as you can see here, so one, two, three, then four, five, six, it's kind of a growing range. There's just three in between each number. So one, four, seven, ten, and then around where the wilds come in, some numbers start to skip. But as you can see, it goes from one all the way to 25. Here we have the game set up for three players, and this is just gonna be a quick overview. Definitely check out Ronnie's video if you want an actual how to play. But the general premise of the game is everyone will be drafting their hand for the trick taking action selection kind of part of the game. Then they'll be playing tricks to decide where they wanna place their control markers on the board for the area control part of the game. And then after that, it will be kind of a resolution phase. So depending on the number of players, there will be a certain number of rounds. So at three, we have three rounds here. It keeps track because of the marriages that you'll be going on. Going on marriages? I don't know. But so how it works is there's different areas of the board, like kind of sections that are part of the game. And then there's the main kind of area control of the game. So everyone starts with a town they control. I'm gonna just cover the different sections of the game so that when I explain the trick taking in a little bit, it'll kind of make more sense. So over here, we have the marriage track where players will be moving up this track, trying to win the favor and the heart of whoever is over here. Then you have this fighting track where players will be kind of taking care of these warriors, I guess taking them out, and they'll be collecting these to help determine who's the strongest warrior in all of Ireland. And then over here is the church track where players will be putting discs over here to help support the church and then get benefits for being the person who supported the church most. Then you have the central area of the board. This is the main area control, where if at the end of the game, if you control this area and it had enough cities in it or big, big enough cities in it, then it will trigger. So like, for example, if at the end of the game, this had one more city in it or just a single strong city, which I'll explain how that works, that will trigger. And then whoever has the most in here will get three points. But I'll get into that a little bit later. So that's the general sections of the board. As you can see on this helpful round structure here, we've already prepared the game because we put out the Vikings and the marriages. Now we're going to draft. So at three players, you're going to draft eight cards. So each player is going to be dealt eight of these cards. After the deal, there will be one card left over because there were 25 cards and eight was dealt to the three players. So they'll just be set to the side. So now players will look at their hand and they're going to pick two of them and then pass the rest off to the left, and then they'll get whatever the person who passed to them. So six cards, and then they'll take two and pass. And I'll keep going around until they have eight cards in hand. So then the trick taking starts. So how the trick taking works is the lead player will take this disc and they will set the active town that they will be fighting over. So maybe they pick right here. Then the lead player will lead to the trick and they have to follow suit with the active town that they just selected. So in this case, this player has to play 
either their two red or, again, any of their wilds, because the wild counts as any suit. So maybe they lead with this 18 in red. So then going around the table, you don't actually have to follow suit in this game. You can play whatever you want. So maybe the blue player over here plays this 25 in blue. And then coming over to green, they decide to play 11 in red. The winner of the trick is the highest in the suit of the active town. So in this case, it was the player who played the 18 red. The winner is going to take the actions in the top part of the card, while the losers get to pick the bottom action or actions they get to choose, if there's more than one, of the card that they lost with. How it resolves first, though, is with the lowest card no matter what. So this 11 will go first. So since they lost, let me turn this so you can see it, they can pick to either take two of these tokens over here, or take two coins and then do this action, which is kind of spreading out, which I'll explain in a little bit. So they just, for now, decide to take two of these tokens. Then you would just discard that card, and then this person would go. What this means is they win the active town that's being fought over, and then they'll discard a coin. So they take the coin, they put it back to the supply, they'll take one of their tokens, and they'll put it on the board, so they are now controlling that area, discard their card. And then this player will either choose to take a token or put three of their discs on the church whoop, section of the board. And they'll just put them over there. They decided to take that bottom action right there. Again, this actually was part of setup, so that's not going on right there. So then they'll discard their card. Then the next trick is the same thing. The person who won the last trick will just find a place they want to fight over again, and then they'll lead with a color that matches the active thing. So again, wilds count as any, so they can lead with this 13. So it's essentially blue in this situation. So then coming over to that player, maybe they play the five red, and then this player will just play the 19. So this player won because they played the highest of the active city's color, but again, it resolves bottom up. So the lowest number goes first. So let's do this action this time. So how it works is you take the number of coins listed, so two in that case, and that will give the blue player enough coins, five, to be able to move out from an area they control into a different area. So they pay their five coins, they're gonna take one of their discs, and they're gonna move out from one of the places they control. So this one is the only one that they can do this to, because it's along a road that you move out from. So they'll pay the five, and they'll put one of their tokens. The blue player didn't have to do that. That's one of the optional things you can do in this game, as opposed to everything else, which is mandatory, you know, like pay coins or get coins. But so they decided to do that top action, so they'll discard this. This player is gonna take two, and again, it's a may, so they're not gonna do that movement, and then discard that. And this player is gonna pay, a coin and put their token on the active town and then they're gonna take this and then tricks like this will just continue over and over and over and again so that symbol just means you're putting a disc in the church this symbol just means you're taking a token from the warrior board and then the symbol with the envelope on it boop, just means you're going up that number of spaces on the track so then after all but one of the tricks are played. So in a three player game, you only play seven of eight cards in your hand. Players will just discard the last card and then you'll do a cleanup phase, which we'll jump into now. So jumping ahead here, we've just finished around one third of the game essentially, and we'll start the upkeep phase. So it starts with the marriage phase. Whoever's at the tallest of the marriage track will get <clears throat> wiped down, but they just won the heart of uh, Bridget here, which is great because they just got four victory points. So purple here will jump up to the fourth spot. The people who are on the track, they don't go down though. They get the benefit on the left. So blue is gonna get two coins, and then green is gonna get a coin. Moving on to the battle stage, if there's any tokens left in here, that means there are still warriors out causing havoc. So whoever has the most is gonna put a token that blocks one of the cities on the person with the least. The person with the most was this green player over here because they had two, and the least was the purple. They didn't have any. So the green is going to put this onto one of the purples. So maybe they do that one right there. What that does is now no one but the board controls that town. So purple doesn't control it, the board controls it. So then we'd remove all the tokens from here. And then the person with the most tokens is the green player over there. They're gonna get a renown token. So what that does is it kind of gives you more points throughout the game. So they'll get one of those renown tokens now. 
Then they're going to score a point for each renown they have, so that's two points. Nice. And then they're going to discard all of those tokens that they got. Then, if there's anyone who has the most now, they're going to discard one of them for one point. So this blue player is going to discard theirs. And now everyone's kind of out. Then we're going to come over to the church section. So whoever has the most is going to take a monastery and the active round, so they'll be the lead player for the next round. They're going to put this on any of the towns they want. So maybe they put it there. And why they would do that is because this essentially beefs up this town. So this is now worth two as opposed to one. So instead of being tied in this area, they are now winning it. Then they would discard all the tokens in that area. Then the person who has the most who's left, which is only green, they'll get rid of one and they'll score a point. Finally, if anyone has four left in there, they'll get a monastery and do it again and then wipe. But no one does. So then we'll get to the claim regions part. So what happens now is you'll see if any of these regions trigger because of a certain amount of cities or strong cities within that region. So it looks like only two of them trigger because over here, even though there's two cities here, it doesn't meet the five threshold. But in this area, it has at least two, not only because of the disc, but also the ring around it counted for one more. So that was three. So now whoever controls this, which is blue, is going to take the token for this area. So it flips and it goes over to them. So they'll have three points at the end of the game if they control that token. So then over here, this one also, because see, it's at least four over here. So Leinster, I think that's how to pronounce it, is going to flip this and it's gonna to go to whoever has the most, which is green. So again, this is important because maybe later on, especially at the end, if there's a tie, it actually stays with whoever got it earlier. So that's kind of why you would dole them out now. So that's the end of the round. Then you would start the next round where you would flip for a new marriage, you'd flip for a different Viking count, you know, so 14 now, and you would shuffle the deck, redeal, you draft and you keep playing until, again, there's no more marriage tokens in here at the end of an upkeep phase. So in three players, you only play three rounds. There's various other things to cover, like what happens with Estrid, who's at the bottom here, but as I said, you can go check out the Ronnie Watch It Played to see a holistic view of the game. So at the very end though, you're gonna get points for whoever has the most gold, you're gonna get points for a renowned token, you're gonna get a point for this token, whoever has it at the end, so this player will get one more. Then you're gonna get area control points. The final thing, you'll also get points for the number of regions that you're in. So in this case, let's say it ended right now, the green is in two different regions. They come over here and they get zero points. Obviously, over the course of the game, they'll be higher up. So this is nice if you spread yourself kind of wide across Ireland. Then whoever has the most points wins, and that's a quick overview of Brian Boru. So that is Brian Boru in all its shininess, the High King of Ireland, or just or just King of Ireland, sorry. Not the Facebook, <laughs> just Facebook. So I, I really liked it. I, I, I wanna say that I personally think it has enough trick-taking kind of DNA to call itself a trick-taking area control game. I know this was kind of debated. I know a lot of people online were comparing the amount of card drafting or Euroness or area controlness to the trick-taking. And even in an interview I read with Peer, I think he said, if I wanna, I wanna get this quote correct, is development took quite a long time because things were taken in and out, but what remained and still remains is that it doesn't feel like a trick taker. Um, I mean, far be it for me to disagree with a designer. I do think it still feels a bit of a trick taker. I wouldn't say too much like it, like if you played a lot of the trick taking games that we cover on the channel and then compared it to this, I think most people would say like, yeah, definitely a different game. But I, what I would say is, I think knowing trick taking and short suiting and keeping track of cards, you know, the, the skills you might pick up from being a good trick taking player, uh, they come in handy. And it's not like if you didn't know any trick taking, you can pick these up. But I think I, I was able to kind of use a little bit of trick taking skills um, to maybe get an advantage or, or understand what to draft a little bit more readily than if I hadn't. So uh, I, I would say it's a little bit more than a whiff of trick taking in this game. Again, drafting area control and Euro probably probably more. In fact, I probably think the area control and the drafting are huge parts of this game compared to the trick taking. But I would say there's a little bit there. So if you were a little hesitant, maybe you saw the review, the reviews that the trick taking was a little lower than what it was. I would say it's still here. Uh, don't go into it for it. And if you wanted a trick taking game, definitely don't go into it for it. But if you like trick taking and you, you didn't mind it being kind of tacked on or added to a game of area control that you really liked, Definitely check this out.
Before we talk a bit more about mechanisms, I do just want to say lovely production. The art is just gorgeous, and as you can even see on the title here, or even on the map, the separating the water from the land, there's a lot of this super shiny, I don't know, embossed? I don't know what the right word is, but it just looks gorgeous. And all the art, on all the cards, everything in this game is, is super great to look at. The symbology and the icons make sense. I think the only con, and this was kind of a bigger con for some people, was the player colors. So you have purple, blue, green, and then orange and yellow, which is tough because on the board, you have kind of like an orangish yellow city, like suit color. So ooh, that was kind of tough to differentiate for us. I, I, I saw some people say online it wasn't too bad for their group, so group dependent, but I think uh, it was a little tough for us. Other than that though, amazing production. To highlight an example of where I thought the trick taking helped make the game better was some of the, the following suit was really interesting. So, so take a look at um, Dublin here. So if you look at this specific area, it is only three cities big, right? And when we were, when we were playing trick taking, I had already controlled two of these cities. So what was cool was when I had the lead, the only city left was this like yellow city. And so no one really wanted it. It was worth two points and it didn't really make sense to fight for it. So what I did, because I knew that if you are off suit, you don't win. I played a super low yellow. So as you can see, when you win with a super low yellow or super low of any card, the win is better. So like, let's say you try to win with this 21, right? You win the active town, that's what that symbol is, and then you lose a coin. Whereas if you win with a super low card, you win the active town and then you move up twice on a certain track. Or maybe like in this one, if you win with a very, very low card, you can get two Viking tokens and like a coin. So. What was fun to play off of was the idea of people actually want to short suit for towns they really don't want to win on. So when you're drafting, you can sometimes push someone to be short suited too much and then never lead that town so they never can win. There was an interesting moment where in a three player game, I was kind of high up on the marriage track at the final round and the person to my right or, or left or whatever, they were drafting me a bunch of these yellow cards because they knew that even if like I didn't really want to win with them because I was going up on the mare track and I knew they knew that half of the bottom actions was just worthless to me because I was gonna pretty much win that marriage anyway so it was it's interesting because you can get into game states especially like you know in all the different colors like if someone has a bunch of viking tokens at the end you can just make them take a lot of red so the drafting and uh, the trick taking work to a place where the person doesn't really want to slough off and take you know the bottom action of colors that they already are doing okay on or well on in the end. So I guess all this, all this, <laughs> all that to say, the the trick taking isn't kind of just a whiff. I would say there's parts that are important, and the fact that it is trick taking is non-trivial. Uh, but again, you know, like, especially compared to like Tindahan, Piers' other um, trick-taking game, it's it's nowhere really near the same kind of feel of a trick-taker and kind of the true essence of like a trick-taking game. But still, there's parts to it that I think are interesting. And since we touched on it, I do really like the draft. I think it's probably up there with area control as one of the more important things. Area control is probably more important in my mind, but the draft is still a big part because you or looking at what's in the game. I mean, only one card, or, you know, not too much is cut out, but you're looking at what you're passing to the person. And you can kind of hate draft, which I think is a classic thing in drafting games, but you can also kind of just pay attention to what you get. And if someone's passing a lot of high cards, maybe they want not to win a lot. So you don't have to draft too high because maybe they don't really care. But it's interesting because I think you can really, since you're taking two each turn, it's a quick draft, but you also have a good amount of control. and I think maybe in games like um, Seven Wonders or Sushi Go, where you have like a, a fair amount of like tough decisions because there's so much you can choose from. Interesting thing in this game is the suits are kind of all, they kind of pigeonhole themselves. So like if you're drafting a blue, you know, you're, you're pretty much like, okay, I know I'm going to be either going up on the church track or I'm going to be winning a blue town. You know, there's not too much 
in my mind, like analysis paralysis, where you're looking at like, oh, which blue to take? Because they're, they're all pretty close, you know? Like even the winning action between a 25 and a 19, right? It's just between losing two coins or one. So maybe at the start, maybe the first game or so, um, I had trouble kind of understanding the deck makeup and kind of really getting a sense of what to draft. I think after some time, it, it, it really became clear on, okay, I have a few yellow and a red. Do I really want to move up on the marriage track, the yellow? Or do I want, you know, more Viking tokens? You can kind of, in the draft, see your state, see the hand that you're drafting from, and really make a not too slow of a decision, somewhat quick decision. I think the area control is really nice. Like, as you can see on the board, there's a fair amount of large and then a fair amount of small uh, areas, and some that are super interesting, like the Southern Ul Neal. I can never say any of these places. But so this one is like a loop, and the roads are super important because I hope I highlighted somewhat well, is the action where you can take, whoa, you can take some coins and then just move across the board. It's actually really uh, important. I notice a lot of times some people will try to go for these border towns that are connected to a road to another area and try to make sure once they get one of these to use that bottom action to run over and kind of get a foothold in another area. So it's cool because I think the map was really well done and has like, like I was saying, this, this circular um, area here, nothing can come in or out. So you can really only get into there through trick play as opposed to some places where, you know, are up in the corner or have like um, <laughs> places without any roads, you know, so you can only get to there through trick play or I guess you could place it at the start. But so I think the, the area control has unique areas, which I think is really important in an area control. I like the idea of fighting over unique places and places that are different from each other, uh, have different kind of incentives, especially with uh, you know point values. But also I thought the area control was interesting because it made it so the trick play was just as important as the, or sorry, winning the trick was just as important as losing the trick because you can area control in both ways. And even in the marriage track, like a lot of the marriage track, you can also area control. The area control did feel different at three and four. What is classic with three player games is sometimes two people will fight over an area and you can, you know, if you're the third, jump over to a different spot and you kind of play off that. The four was a little tighter. I haven't played at five, so just three and four. But so the four kind of made it to where there was a little bit more balance, a little bit more ties, which was probably better for this game. You know, because you have those monasteries and it makes it so those and then the Vikings covering up. It made it so a little bit more interesting situations where everything was kind of one off. So that one point off was, was more important. As opposed to in three, it was kind of like, okay, that person kind of has that. That person kind of has that. There were some fights for sure. And I think a lot of times one, some of them were one off. But I think at four, it was just a little bit tighter. Uh, what was interesting at four, getting back to like the trick play, is you play one more round, but you have fewer hands. So you're actually a little bit more limited in the cards. At three, you only play three rounds, but you have, you know, seven tricks out of eight cards. So you have a pretty good amount of flexibility, especially at the start. Whereas at four, you have, uh, I think it's six cards. You only play five tricks, I believe. It's, it's interesting that just one different player count limited hand options a lot. I found that both games were quick, though. Uh, I, I don't think there's too much in the rules that slows, slows down much. Definitely uh, the upkeep is, is quick and it kind of makes sense and it's intuitive. I think players would only drag down the decisions really in the drafting and in the trick play, which is always nice. So sitting behind me, you might see it, but Inish or Innis, I could see some people comparing these games because it's area control, it's drafting, it has uh, gorgeous art, <laughs> um, but I think they're very different games. So I've played this about the same amount um, and I would say this has you know crazy locations, crazy powers, even the cards you draft that are basic every round have crazy moments. And a big part of the area control in Brian Boru is once you've won a, a town, it can really only get covered up or taken from you by the Vikings. So it's a very, it's a known, it's like almost like a known input output. You can't really um, lose that in too many different ways. So there's not too much like kind of swinginess and craziness. Whereas in this one, it's like, you know, you can lose two dudes and it's kind of a dudes on the map thing. So like you can lose two people and then gain a person or someone could wipe your, like it's just like too crazy and swingy. So I don't really get the comparison. I probably wouldn't compare them too much, especially because 
what I've noticed is this game is almost, this game being Brian Boru, is almost like comically balanced. What I mean by comically balanced, and I don't find this as a con or an issue, but someone with I played with definitely could kind of see this being an issue or kind of felt this way, was everything was very balanced. Um, so maybe starting at the trick play, you know, if you win, you get a bonus. If you lose, you get one of the two bonuses. So every trick, you get something, and it's so open because you can you don't have to follow suit that you can kind of get what you want a lot. And I, I think this is a good thing. It's funny to, to say it's it's a bad thing, but so as you play, everyone's kind of getting a lot of stuff, and it's it's mostly balance. And what we noticed was in the games we played and the games that we asked our friends how they went is it was very close in the scores, like all the time, like either ties or within one, like all the players within one or two. And it's interesting. I actually like close games. I like um, getting down to ties and nail, nail biter type situations. And it's impressive that all the games I've played of this have been super tight. But it was funny to play with people who were used to trick taking games where things are generally pretty swingy. I know I've talked about this in the past. And I even have like a board game geek kind of discussion about this on the trick taking guild where trick takers are kind of just swingy games, you know, you can get dealt a bad hand of cards and just get kind of crazy and, and things can't go your way. But in this game, so there's drafting, so there's no real swinginess in the draw. Um, but even in a drafting trick taker like Vashtikt or Voltreffler, there's still moments of this game where you've drafted your hand, but things can still go wrong for you. You know, it's a trick taker, any, anything can happen. But in this game, um, there's so much mitigation and there's so much like win or lose is good that most of the time people do really well. And I, I, I read this once about like a Flamme Rouge critique where someone was like, every single time I play, it's always close. And I hate that. It's like, I want to know that if I mess up, I'm going to get a bad score, which is interesting. It's very like splatter, you know, like food chain magnet kind of mentality where, yeah, you can just mess up and be, and be bad. In this game, I, I, I'm sure you could go out of your way to do a bad job, but if you were really trying, even like a bad player would still do pretty good, which is interesting. I don't, I don't think that's a, that's a bad thing. Um, I could see people being like, oh, this game is just always close, or this always feels like a same arc where we're just going to come down a tiebreak or something like that. So I don't know if that's an issue for you or if you see that as an issue. Um, I don't even know if that's true. Honestly, I haven't played it enough to see if all the scores are tight. It's kind of an interesting, like, mentality question is like, do you like games that are always tight? Um, like if you had to choose, like if the game you played was always close, would that be interesting to you? Would it lose some of its tension if you knew it was always going to be close? Again, I don't know if that's true. I haven't played enough, but it was, it was interesting that in every game I've played, it has been within, you know, three or four points between the leader and the loser and a lot of ties, but I, I like it. So I don't know why I'm going off on this kind of like more philosophical tangent, but the game is very balanced. That's what I meant by comically, cosmically balanced. So that is Brian Baru. And I definitely say way more of a drafting and area controlled game, but I wouldn't discount the trick taking. And I think it, uh, it deserves to have that trick taking kind of tack on the end there. Again, nothing to come for. I wouldn't, I wouldn't come for the trick taking, but maybe I'd stay for it. I think it's good. Overall, it's definitely like a track game. It's definitely an area control and drafting game. And I think what it does with those systems is it does it pretty well. So definitely check this out if those are your flavor and then you also like trick taking. But if you don't like trick taking, I don't know why you're watching a trick taking specific channel. That's gonna be something you need to figure out for yourself. But thanks so much for watching. Hmm? Hmm? Wait, wait, Is that pretty good? Huh?